leaders of tomorrow, the only show on Indian television where you, the MSME, get center stage. This is ET Now's special daily initiative to give MSMEs and entrepreneurs the opportunity to be front and center on every industry and every area that matters to you. Two conversations tonight on our show on Influencer. First up, we'll feature DTDC and later on the show, a conversation with Exceed. The logistics industry in India is booming and to get an overview really on this industry, I spoke with Abhishek Chakrabarti, he's the ED of DTDC, on what else perhaps this industry needs if the last mile is to be fixed, what else is needed by way perhaps of government regulation and why having a sound logistics partner in place is crucial for MSMEs. Take a look at this exclusive conversation. Abhishek, thank you so much for coming down to our studios, talking to us here on Leaders of Tomorrow, talking to MSMEs who are in the logistics space. Right. Let's kick this off by talking about DTDC, your journey, what the story there, what the growth has really been like. Sure, sure. So, we are a business started in 1990. Uh, this was back when uh, being a startup was not a fashionable thing and mm. you really had to struggle for capital, you had to really struggle for good quality people. And we started off very small as a simple courier company, uh, largely distributing small packets and uh, letters uh, for our customers. But over the last 25, 27 years that we've been in business, I think uh, as the country has undergone a huge uh, sea change in terms of its growth, in terms of the way businesses and industries have grown, our business too has really taken shape. And sure. from being a very small player with very limited ambitions today, we're probably the most holistic uh, Indian multinational company in that sense that covers every aspect of the logistics space, right from handling your courier documents, your sh large shipments, your express parcels, your B2C, B2B, including a very thriving international network that we okay. run. So uh, for us, uh, you know, I would say that the journey has been one where uh, we've grown with the nation, but particularly in the last five to six years, I think uh, is a huge transformation that we're seeing in our business, which is just taking us to an altogether different level as a business okay. as well. So you were talking about one of the challenges um, perhaps of having set up your business at a time when startups weren't so exciting. Right. Uh, and while you're not a typical startup in right. that sense, right. I want to talk about how easy perhaps or difficult it was to raise finance, especially for someone who's a young entrepreneur like yourself. Right, right. What were some of the challenges? And based on that, how can you advise our viewers who tell us all the time that they're facing huge challenges when it comes to raising funds. So what advice would you have for them? So I think, you know, back in the day when we started uh, with the first generation of our business really getting kick-started, it was largely use your personal finances, you yeah. borrow money from your friends, family, your wife it probably. It still seems to be you that. Know, it still yeah. seems to be a bit of that. Mm -hmm. But I think uh, uh, today the market in terms of uh, if you've got a great idea and if you've got a good product and you've got the right business and work ethics in place, I think there are a lot more people who are interested to listen to you. Uh, especially I think in the last few years with a lot of small finance banks uh, mm -hmm. taking off, off uh, microfinance lending really coming into the picture. I think the people want to give credit, but they want to give credit to a business that has probably an interesting story. Uh, and I would say that as long as you're a brand that is not just wanting to be a me too player, you really want to tell a unique story. Yes, it may make profits five years or 10 years into the future, but you have a unique story. And I think there is a lot more willingness for people uh, to either work for you as well as probably give you credit and, and lend some money. Along okay. the way. Sure. I noticed that 65% um, of your business comes from the express logistics space and market. Right. Uh, how has that changed? How is that growing for you? Uh, why is the segment looking so exciting for you? Yeah. Uh, so express logistics in that sense really defines that space of the whole yeah. transportation or, or business where literally customers have a value for the product where they need it delivered on time uh, within a very specific uh, service level. Um, now, historically, where businesses used to follow a slightly different model, where it was okay to hold on to a lot of inventory, you would have lots of warehouses across the country to meet every state's requirements, you would probably uh, have a lesser demand for express logistics. You'd probably go for the traditional transport sort of a business. But today, with the changes that we are seeing in place, with GST coming into effect, with a lot more infrastructural improvements coming in, I think people are clearly looking for time and quality of service as the decider and that's where Express Logistics really comes in. So we're seeing tremendous growth. Uh, we're looking at uh, close to 20 to 25 percent CAGR growth for the next three to five years. Okay. And uh, we see that Express Logistics will be the preferred mode of choice for people who want to do business and move material across the country or across borders as well. Okay. GST, of course, is the big talking point. So let's, uh, you know, come straight to yeah. that. How is GST? First and foremost, let's talk from an industry perspective. 
it has impacted the logistics space. What have been some of the biggest changes? Uh, well, I would probably talk about the positives first. And I think okay. the, the first positive we see is the fact that finally, the uh, uh, you know, an implementation of a borderless country in terms of yeah. movement of material is beginning to take shape. Mm -hmm. uh, even six or seven months back when GST was not yet in effect, you would have your trucks and your transport systems uh, probably log jamming in every state border and having difficulty in trying to clear yeah. state borders. And therefore, it was causing delays and problems for your clients. At least at the first level with that aspect really beginning to get relaxed and having more, uh, I would say, transparency coming through, we see a lot of improvement in that space. But I think beyond that, there is a lot more that uh, needs to be fixed in terms of the process. Because today, I think there's a lot of confusion that is existing in the market. Mm -hmm. So we face real situations where sometimes we as industry players might have a view on how GST needs to be charged to a client or how you know, the, the process needs to be done. But a client might have sometimes a diagonally opposite view. Okay. And at this point in time, without... Uh, but there is no room for ambiguity because it has been laid down. True, true. But mm. I think uh, the, the finer details only emerge when you have real live okay. examples and cases coming through. You know, okay. So, for example, you might have certain clients who might have offices all across the country, mm. but their entire p &L is being managed only from one center. Okay. You might have sometimes the reverse that, you know, mm. uh, you want to have each and every state, you still want to retain an, an individual entity, but your services might get procured from different states. So, all sure. of that means that a level of complexity uh, at a, you know, I would say at a scale of probably two or three times the complexity that used to exist has gotten added in terms okay. of managing their entire transaction. Okay. And that's where you tend to have sometimes those, uh, you know, uh, teething troubles with, with your customers or with your own internal systems. So I think mm. that has been probably the biggest uh, uh, challenge. And I see that that challenge has been more for smaller operators because okay. those of our people like us who seriously invest on technology are have a digital first approach to business are, you know, we were able to start planning solutions even more than 12 or 18 months back when we said that let's start putting processes in place in anticipation. Mm. But I think a lot of smaller businesses or businesses that were probably waiting for the last minute to understand what the final law, how it would take shape, mm. they probably face more challenges. And I, the only good thing I would say is the government at least has been uh, mindful of the fact and they have given a lot of relaxations in the initial launch phase. Mm. They have, you know, come down on certain points which were very strict probably on day one, but they've given some leniency mm. on that, which I think at least is a, is a proactive measure to say that, yes, it's complex, it's challenging. So we will wait and we'll be patient okay. as this change happens. There is also now infrastructure status that has come yeah. to the logistics yeah. space. All good on that? All positive? Are you happy? Uh, yes, I think we, we would say that we are happy okay. about it because at, at, at the very least, it means that you finally have a level of recognition as an industry. Yeah. Uh, because this industry has served businesses, you know, in across countries, not just in India for, for ages. But somehow this industry was always marginalized, or always mm. looked down upon or looked as a fringe industry, mm. not probably getting the same focus as probably retail Transport. or, tra uh, yeah. you know, the proper, you know, modern trade or probably sectors such as pharma, mm. uh, you know, commodities and others. It never used to probably get the same attention. Yet mm. it was the critical cog in the wheel that made everything Absolutely. else work. Yeah. So I think with this status, I see it as a signal that finally the agenda or the issues of this industry are going to be on, on, on top of the government's agenda, okay. number one. Number two, I see that with this coming in place, probably it's a sign that in the next three to five years, we could see regulations coming in. Uh, mm -hmm. Just as it happened in the telecom industry, initially telecom was a little bit of a wild west, but once you had the TRA, TRAI and similar agencies coming in, you saw a lot more controls, you saw better quality of products, you actually saw prices also getting more rationalized and consumers at the end of the day benefited. So I see mm. regulation is something which will probably come more in this industry. Mm. And that means an industry which has been highly fragmented and subject to vagaries of all kinds of, uh, you know, irregularities yeah. finally gets a chance to, you know, get itself in order and start becoming a high performing industry, which becomes a critical input to the overall growth of the GDP of the nation. Sure. As we're closing this interview then, um, what uh, are the next say five years looking like or is that too long a time frame and do you want to talk about what the short term is looking like for you? Sure. So yeah, in today's world with the amount of change that mm. we see, probably five years definitely seems like long term. Okay. But I would say in the next two to three years uh, is a period that we, we are looking at uh, tremendous growth. Yeah. Uh, I think the opportunities that are opening up, the business models that are opening up are, are, are tremendous. Mm. Uh, we see ourselves no longer as just being a vendor or a service provider. We actually see ourselves as probably in some cases a consultative partner to our clients because we are sitting with our clients designing their supply chains in the post-GST world. And that means it's a different level of responsibility. It obviously means a lot more growth, but it means that we are going to see a massive introduction of uh, technologies, newer technologies. Uh, we're going to see a lot of infrastructure growth coming up. We are heavily investing on 
uh, systems such as sortation, uh, AI, okay. uh, you know, within the next three months, we are actually coming up with the largest integrated express facility in the country for our industry. Sure. Because we're just expecting that kind of boom and growth to happen. So I see a phase of heavy growth, a lot of investment on quality systems and technologies, and obviously playing a very different kind of a role for your clients, where you're no longer a vendor, but you're actually a partner to them in their growth story. Abhishek, thank you so much for coming down and speaking with us. Thank you very much. Thank it's been you. a pleasure. Time for a break. When we come back, Exceed is our second influencer tonight. Do stay tuned. We will bring you an in-depth conversation. with us here on Leaders of Tomorrow and tonight we're putting the focus on Exceed on our Influencer Conversation. Ashish, thank you very much for speaking with us here on Leaders of Tomorrow. Let's start by talking about education quality. When it comes to the quality of school education in India, we still lag behind many countries. How are you seeing that changing at Exceed and what are you doing about quality of education? So massive challenge in India, as in many other developing countries. I think what has changed in the last 40, 50 years is there was a time when a few were expected to be skilled and very well educated. Now the expectation is that each and every kid needs to come out with those skills. And hence, uh, it's a massive challenge. Children are coming out of schools not only unable to read and write and do math, like we hear in many of the reports, but more importantly, the demand of the workplace is being able to do something. Children should be able to solve problems. They should be able to understand. Memorizing things is not going to solve anything. You know, So knowing your tables and state capitals is not what is going to solve things for you. And schools are struggling with this. Now what Exceed has been able to do is build a structured curriculum which goes into every class and improves the process of learning and teaching so that every child can learn. The EXCEED process has a very simple five-step framework. The first step is start a lesson with a clear aim. Follow that with some kind of activity or experiment instead of jumping into the lecture right away. Third, after the experiment or activity, have a dialogue with the child, get the child to reflect and ask questions on what happened. Step four, practice, 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 very important. And step five, the proof of the pudding is in eating. So assessment is important to know whether you learned the topic. One thing which is important to mention in this is very often people talk of creative classrooms, progressive classrooms, interesting classrooms, engagement of children. And on, on the other end, there is a set of people who talk about testing, practice, drill. Exceed is taking the middle path. We say both is important. Creativity is important. Engagement is important. The interest of the child is important. But you can't stop there. You have to practice. You have to assess. You have to know whether the child has learned. So we are straddling this path and it is showing interesting results. So we are very hopeful. Technology is uh, changing every industry, every space as we speak in India. Talk to us about the role of technology in the education space today then. I think technology has a massive role to play. And I say that in spite of the fact that if you look at the results of the last 15 odd years in technology, there isn't that much to show. Both the ed tech industry in the United States, for instance, which has attracted a lot of funding, as well as the so-called ed tech boom that happened in India, hasn't shown visible results. The reason we believe that is the case is because we have not successfully separated out the role of the teacher and the role of the technology. Technology is being foisted upon the existing way of working. The day we are able to separate out the two, I think we will see success. So our belief is that in matters of assessment, for instance, in matters of content and resources, even in matters of creating the right experiences in the classroom, technology is going to play a huge role and maybe take over all of it. Technology can actually do that better than human beings. 
but in matters of motivation matters of where the teacher needs to pay attention to each child and figure out why the child is not learning or not delivering result i don't think that role of the teacher the role of the human being is going away anytime soon and for young children that's our area of work children between the ages of 3 to 13 i think it's here to stay for a very long time so we for instance strongly believe that assessment there can be a lot more that can happen with technology if children have individualized devices so be it but even without there are many technologies which can be used uh thin video as we call it small videos of 1 minute 1 and 1/2 minute 2 minutes uh, have great opportunity gaming in the future but we feel the full potential of video has not been utilized uh, resources in the classroom uh, bringing experiences to the classroom huge opportunity and the biggest benefit of all i believe is likely to be regular feedback to children in fancy language people it call it adaptive but even simpler forms of giving regular feedback to children uh, can bring a lot of benefit in their learning path do you want to tell our viewers about exceed max uh, your latest offering so exceed has been criticized for being slow on technology and the reason is that we take our time to work on a product till it actually delivers learning for children so exceed max comes on the back of 3 years of very deep research on what will actually work for children in schools so exceed max is a digital classroom in which children are not only watching the digital content but actually participating in a hands on manner so the max program has a half an hour lesson board which runs the entire lesson which is experiential children can do activities hands on in real time so for instance if a class on levers is being taught children are actually making levers with their notebooks and scales and rubbers right there on their desks and the role of the teacher then becomes to facilitate this experience so she can stop the less the digital lesson and then intervene ask children questions respond to their queries so in our in our view it's a very good match of use of technology and use of the teachers uh, facilitational skills very importantly there is a max journal in which children jot down what they have learned so the writing part is very important especially for young children and finally there's an assessment so the assessment is a computerized assessment in which parents on their app get regular feedback every month on how their kid is doing so it's really a digital school in a box which keeps the teacher in mind keeps the kid in mind and brings a uh, high quality learning let's discuss fund raising at this point ashish shah how is fund raising been in the education space how difficult perhaps has that journey been we took a slightly contrarian approach uh, i waited a very long time to raise money very often what happens is people at the outset go and raise money very quickly perhaps even more than they need and dilute the company shareholding way ahead of time so we waited till we not only invented a product had proof of concept had shown scaling exceed had already reached close to 100000 children by the time we raised funds so and at that time we got a lot of attention because we were one of the few stories which had been able to scale up and show that this product works now in the last few years there have been ups and downs that they always are but i don't think uh, one should wait to time the market we should only raise capital when we really uh, need it and only as much as we need it for any business to have scale you have to of course look at demand that you're getting from outside of the metros so can you talk about your exceed model and how perhaps you're looking at adapting that model for tier 2 and tier 3 oh we are in smaller towns so exceed is in 3000 plus schools this is tier 1 towns tier 2 tier 3 tier 4 even semi rural so we are in cbsc schools icsc schools state board schools of various kinds uh, exceed is a program that can run under a tree and it can run in a fancy international school since its inception exceed has of course made a difference to the lives of millions of school going children but talk to us about the future what's that looking like for you so exceed is now a million children in 3000 schools our vision is to reach 10 million children over the next few years half these children in india but half elsewhere all developing countries have similar problems 
and to empower personalized learning for every kid using technology. So miles to go, barely got started. Ashish Rajpal, thank you very much for speaking with us here on Leaders of Tomorrow. That's our show tonight. If you have any feedback, you can always write to us at leadersoftomorrowtimesgroup.com. On social media, tweet at me at sunanda underscore j or lot underscore et now. On Facebook, we're at Leaders of Tomorrow on et now. Or you can call us on that number you see on your screen. We love hearing from you. Thanks very much for watching. Have a good night.